walking on to a uh, quick joke real quick. There was a uh, there was a man, a rich man, riding by in his limousine. And all of a sudden he sees this family on the side of the road eating grass. And as he goes by, he's like, that's pretty odd right there. So he tells his driver, he says, pull over, turn around and go back. So they do, they pull around and head back. And the rich man rolls down his window, he says, what are y'all doing? And the man, he says, well, I've, uh, I'm following a little short of a look. says, I lost my job, we don't have no money coming in, and we're hungry, and so we was eating this grass. By that time, the rich man said, get all your stuff, get in the car, and I'll take you to my house. He rolls up his window as they're getting up their stuff. The driver says, sir, that's a little odd for you, isn't it? For you to offer your house to somebody? He says, well, the way I see it, my house is perfect. My grass is a foot tall. Preach <laughs> 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 made me, ain't he? Mark, does everybody stand? We're going to read in Luke chapter number 2. Luke chapter number 2. We're going to read verses 13 and 14. Everybody there say amen. 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 Let us read. And suddenly there was with an angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Let's read that last verse one more time. Verse 14. Glory to God in the highest, on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you so much. Lord, we're so thankful for you. Lord, we just ask and pray right now that you would be with us. Lord, we're just thankful for your word. Lord, we're thankful for the people that have given their lives to you this morning through baptism. And Lord, we just ask right now that you would bless us, that you would fill this place with your Holy Spirit. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Notice that word right there in verse 14. Peace. Peace. Now everybody, if you will, flip with me to Mark chapter number 4. Mark chapter number 4. And we're going to read a story right here. Very familiar passage. We're going to be in verses 35 to 41. Everybody there say amen. 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 Let's read. And the same day when the evening was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him, even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him, and saith unto him, Master, carest that thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a, cry, uh, a, a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind of the sea obey him? Tony, will you turn this water down, please? This morning I want to talk to y'all about a thing called peace. Now think about something here. Next week, next Tuesday, is Christmas Day. And each and every one of you are hoping to get a present. Amen? Amen. I, you know, I don't care how old I get. It is wonderful getting presents. Getting gifts. Something I don't deserve. Something I hope for. You know, uh, Amy's mom and dad asked me the other week. They said, what do you want for Christmas this year? I said, oh, let me show you. Amen? <laughs> we, we, throughout the year, we see all kinds of things. Now the problem is, as we get older, a lot of our gifts get a lot more expensive. Amen? Amen. Yeah. 
And we can't afford them, nor would we feel good asking somebody to buy us something that costs so much. But either way, we love things. I remember as a child, you just want a bunch of toys. The beauty of it is, as a parent, they don't cost a whole lot. Then they get into them younger, a little bit older ages, where they want now tablets and bicycles, all these things. It costs a little more, but it's still better. Then they hit those teenage years. And oh my goodness, you have to take out a second mortgage on your house to buy Christmas. I remember one year for Christmas, I told Mom I had to have these nice. Now, when I was a kid, to pay $80, $90, for a pair of shoes was pretty ridiculous. I know it's kind of common now, but back then, you just didn't do that. And I said, but i got to have these shoes, right? And I mean, y'all, I pitched a fit for these shoes. And then, my mom, she was pretty slick. I get this little bitty box. She said, here, you can open this box. I said, I don't want that box. Can't no shoe fit in that box, right? She had put the shoelaces in a little Crayola box. <laughs> but the thing is, we love Christmas. We love this time of the year where we get to open gifts and presents. And it's just a wonderful time of year. But what is one gift all the way across the world everybody wants? It's peace. It's peace. It's even to a point where when our families and our loved ones die, we put on their headstone, rest in peace. When these young girls get up on a stage <coughs> trying to win the Miss America pageant, and they say, what would you like to see? World peace. It's, it's the common word that everybody says, everybody uses. Peace. Let me give you the definition. This is the Webster definition of peace. It is freedom from disturbance, quiet and tranquility, mental calm, serenity, the peace of mind. This assurance gives you. And here's the second definition of it. Freedom from or the ceasing of war or violence. We all want peace. A lot of us men go out and play golf and fish and hunt trying to get peace from jobs and bills and the rush of life. A lot of women go shopping to get peace Hello. from every aspect of life. And we all want this one thing called peace. But as we read in this story right here, Jesus, with the disciples, as they're getting ready to go out on this ship, I want to show you all three things this morning that will help you this year get the gift of peace. And as you read right here, first off, I want you to notice, look what it says right there in verse 36. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship, and they were in the, were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of the wind and of the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him, saying, Master, carest not that we perish? Now there's something about this right here that first off you got to understand. And this is point number one. You need a relationship with Jesus Christ. You need Jesus Christ in your life. Amen. You need a part of Jesus Christ in everything you do. You want Him to follow you. You want Him to be with you. You want Jesus. No matter what. And right here, they take Jesus. And they say, Jesus, come get on our ship. And so Jesus does. And so that's the, that's the point. That's the key right here. Of point number one. Is you want Jesus with you. 
Because I'm going to tell you something. Storms are going to rise up in life. Things are going to happen in life. And you're going to say, Jesus, where are you at? You're going to want Him with you at all times. Notice the thing here. They're on the Sea of Galilee. On this sea, this sea is known for storms just Food popping up out of nowhere. Y'all know how like in the summertime, about 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon is a lot of time. Then pop up afternoon showers just come out of nowhere. And the booming and the thunder and the lightning that you can get from them sometimes. And then it's just as quick as they come, they're gone. Well, that's the way it is on this sea, this Sea of Galilee. You can be sailing along the clearest day, the most beautiful day you've ever seen. And then all of a sudden, boom! A storm comes up and it can be rough. And as they're sailing along here, they're wanting Jesus. But the funniest thing has happened. Jesus is sound asleep. Now, let me give you this. You know, I, I'm sitting here and I'm like, why would Jesus be sleeping? Number one, why wouldn't the disciples have Jesus right there with them? How many of y'all have ever taken a long trip and a car? What have you told? Now, now, this is before Red Bull and Monster and everything else. Starbucks. <coughs> what do you tell the person beside you? Make sure I stay awake. Make sure nothing happens. And guess what? You and that person carry on a conversation the whole time, sometimes deep, sometimes just random gossip, and all of a sudden you're at your destination. Time is going by. You never thought about getting sleepy or anything. You were just as fine and happy, and guess what? You never went to sleep. Well, as the disciples are sailing, sailing along this ship, guess what happens? Evidently, they quit talking. To Jesus. No, I don't know that for faith. I'm, I'm just speculating here. But Jesus all of a sudden is like, well, they don't need me. I think I'm going to take a nap. Yeah. Now, y'all got to understand something. At this time, Jesus was 100% man and 100% God. Man. And the 100% man gets sleepy. Amen, man. Yeah. <laughs> Matter of fact, my aunt used to say, we got a switch on our tail right there. And the minute we sit it down, whoop, lights go out. Because if you ever met my dad and my uncle and my brother, you see, we sit down just good and whoop, lights go out. Matter of fact, somebody, uh, I ain't going to call his name now, fell asleep in church last week. And, then, and some people were talking to me about him. And I was like, well, I can't really say nothing because I can't say I never slept in church myself. Amen? <laughs> you get just snug down in that pew just right and the switch gets flipped there when you know you. And God, I'm the type, I get the head bobbing pretty much. <laughs> I just get to agree with the preacher a lot more than I do. But, but Jesus, they, they didn't want to talk to him. They didn't want to bother with him. And guess what happened? He fell asleep. He fell asleep on the ship. And see, you see, where's Jesus? Well, when you don't talk to him for a while, he's not listening to you. We need prayer in our lives. Prayer is your communication with Jesus. Prayer is how you have conversation with Jesus. You say, well, he don't ever talk back. Well, you ain't prayed hard and long enough to do Y'all, I'm going to tell you something, and it's, it's just true. I'm, I'm standing up here telling the truth straight from my heart. I have carried on a conversation with God, and nobody else can hear it but me and him. But he spoke just as clear to me. And I thought to myself, really, Lord, that's what you want? And I stepped out on faith. And guess what? It was so true. And I never, ever, never would have done it had he not spoken it to me. He may not be sitting beside you. You might not can touch him. But I promise 
You need to talk to Him. Amen. You need a relationship with Him. Amen. What happens when you quit talking to your husband or to your wife? They, number one, don't think you're mad at them. And number two, they might even get to a point and think you're cheating on them. Well, you don't ever talk to me anymore. You don't want nothing to do with me anymore. The Bible says, pray without ceasing. Constantly in prayer. You know, Daniel, in the book of Daniel, Daniel was told, do not pray. Do not let us catch you praying to your God anymore. But you know something that Daniel did from the time he was a little bitty young man all the way up to this adult part of his life? Three times a day he spoke to God. He got on his knees no matter what and he prayed to God. And the day they told him, we better not catch you praying to God again. He went up in his room and he opened the window so all the world could see and he fell on his knees and he said, Lord God, and he commenced to pray. Well, you say, Jonathan, they throw him in the lion's den for that. Yeah, well, guess who showed up in the lion's den? God. No matter what, they cannot stop you from praying. Nobody. They can take this book from you. They can cast you into a pit. They can throw you wherever you want to go. Wherever they want to put you. But they cannot stop you from praying. You can pray no matter what. You can speak to your Heavenly Father no matter what. Nobody can stop you from praying. They say, well, in schools, you're not allowed to pray no more. <laughs> you can pray if you want to. You can pray on your jobs if you want to. You can do what you want to do as far as prayer and goes. And I promise you, when you pray, and for the right reason, don't just do it for despite, just to put on a show or something like that. When you pray out of the sincerity of your heart for the people you're working with, for your family, for your life, for God's will in your life, I promise you, God, just like Daniel, will protect you and take care of you. I promise you. But that's point number one this morning. We must have prayer with God. We must speak to God constantly. Number two, they didn't have faith. Look what it says right there. They run down there and they wake up Jesus. They say, Jesus, you got to wake up. We're about to die. We're about to perish. Don't you care? Don't you even care that we're about to die? Now, first off, you've got to understand something. They're with Jesus. And they know they are with Jesus. They have already seen some of Jesus' miracles. They've already seen the multitudes follow Jesus. They are His disciples. And they know who Jesus is. That's why they're running down here and waking him up when they get scared. Because if anybody can help them, it's Jesus. So what do they do? They go down there in fear. And they say, don't you care? And look what it says in verse 40. And he said unto them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? How is it that you cannot trust in me? Why are you so scared? Why do you live in constant fear? Because you don't have faith. 
Y'all been quoting this scripture a lot. We quoted it last week. If God be for you, who can be against you? If God is with you, if God is taking care of you, if God is blessing you, who can be against you? What can be against you? What can be so bad that God cannot take care of it? Nothing. The answer is nothing. Paul goes on later on in Romans chapter 8 to say, I don't care if it's death or principality or anything of this world or not of this world or in the heavens. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. This is unconvinced God. And when we show lack of faith, we show lack of trust in God. Lack of, He's not going to take care of me. He's not going to feed me. He's not going to make sure i got a job or money. He's not going to... You, you get where I'm going here? Let me show you something. The beauty of this morning is, ain't every one of you butt naked in here. You all got on clothes. So guess what? He clothed you. How many of y'all haven't eaten in the last 24 hours? Well, it was my choice. Because I know the ones that raised your hand. He's provided food for you. How many, how many of y'all slept outside last night on purpose? He's provided shelter for you. How many of y'all had a way to get to church this morning and are sitting here? Now, granted, I know some of y'all have physical problems, but He still provided you with help. He still provided. He still <coughs> helped David. And yet, when the, when the company says we're shutting down, we're closing. You're like, oh no, I'm not going to have a job. Oh no, what am I going to do? Oh no. But now I can honestly say in 36 years of my life, I have never not had clothes or food or a place to stay. <coughs> in 36 years. Now I'm going to tell you something, I've stayed and little bit in and eaten, not eaten, some rough stuff in 36 years. <coughs> but God has always provide. Now can I stand right here and say I didn't know where our next paycheck was coming from? Absolutely. I didn't know how we was going to pay certain bills. Matter of fact, I remember there was a time when Amy showed me the stack of bills and the money that we had. And I said, what are we going to do? I remember a couple times where the power actually went out. We thought the money was talking, but no, we just forgot to pay the bill because we didn't have the money to pay the bill. Amen. Amen. But guess what? God provided the money. <coughs> Matter of fact, Friday night, I was laying in the bed, and it was late. I'm a night out. And the power went out for a quick second. I said, oh no! And y'all, it was the funniest thing. I thought to myself, did we pay the bill? <laughs> but I know Miss Louise always pays the bill. And all of a sudden, I, come back, I don't know what happened. But anyway, it's, just, it's just crazy. But God has always, always, always provided. God has always showed up when we don't deserve it. You know, I remember my... Uh, my Preacher, his wife saying when preacher, preacher was working for Delta. Preacher was making really, really, really good money working for Delta. And he felt God calling him to preach. And so he sold everything they had, packed up all their stuff. He's in his early 30s, a wife and two kids, and moves up to Tennessee Temple to go to seminary. And he says, while he was in seminary, he said, we were so poor, broke, just didn't have nothing. And Miss Faye said that at one time she had to pay, and I forget what it was, but she had to have 
like right at $100. Maybe it was the power, maybe it was the rent. I can't remember. And she started, she just fell on her knees and she said, Lord, I just don't know what I'm going to do. She said, you know, we don't have the money. So, Lord, you know there's no way I can pay this. But, Lord, I need you right now to show up and to show out. And she said, within that moment, within an hour or so, somebody come knocking on their door. And a lady handed her a check and says, I don't know why, but God <coughs> told me I needed to give this to you. And Miss Faye hugged her and she leaves. And Miss Faye opened it up and it was to the penny how much they needed. Where God guides, God provides. But we must have faith that He provides for us. We must have faith that He is going to take care of us no matter what. He always has. And he always will. But you know the problem with faith? You can't feel it. Or you can't see it. You can't always see things. Well, let me ask you a question this morning. How many of y'all are breathing? Every one of y'all. I hope everybody. Show me the oxygen you're breathing. Show me what you're breathing. Show it to me. Come on, somebody. Don't light up no cigarette in church to show me. But, but you can't show me oxygen. But guess what? It ain't stopped you from breathing. You're steady breathing in. You're steady trusting in oxygen. The Bible said, walk by faith, not by sight. Don't walk by things you can see, things you can feel, things you trust. Matter of fact, it says over here in Hebrews, listen to this. Hebrews 11, 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11, 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You might not can say, well, you know what? I trust God and here God is. But what you have to do is trust he's there. Trust He's always been there and trust He'll always be there and trust He will protect you and be with you and there for you no matter what. He's never let you down. And now can't you just understand the frustration in Jesus when He says, why do you have no faith? Why can't you trust I'm here? Everything is fine. Why don't you have faith? Faith brings peace. Why don't you have it? And finally, point number three this morning. They're living in fear. Why are they so scared? Why can't they trust in Jesus? Here's the point. Because they've forgotten God's promises. Now I want you to look at this and when you look at this you'll never look at this story the same. First off, look right there in verse 40. He said unto them, why are you so fearful? Why in the world would they be so scared? Why would they think what would make you scared unless you thought you were about to die? How many of y'all have ever had one of them moments where you almost died? Whether it be a car wreck or something happened. And all of a sudden the fear just sets in instantly. I've been in some storms of before myself. And guess what? All of a sudden the fear sets in like, are we going to make it through this? And here's what happened. Jesus says, why do you not have faith? Why aren't they trusting 
and God's promises. Look at verse 35. And the same day, when the evening was come, he said unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. Jesus had already promised them they were going to make it. He had already said, we're going to the other side. And yet they forgot. Yet they did not remember what he said. What does the Bible say to us? That if God be for you, who can be against you? The greater is he that is within me than he is in the world. Read the book of Revelation. See how it ends. We win, y'all. We win. But guess what happens? Something don't go our way. A storm pops up without ever knowing it. You never saw this storm coming. Just boom. And all of a sudden you're in this storm. And guess what's happening? Fear sets in. And what happens when fear sets in? Anxiety sets in. And what happens when anxiety sets in? Stress sets in. And what happens when fear and anxiety and stress set in? You're miserable. You live miserable, depressed lives. Because you have forgotten God's promises. If you are a child of God, you don't die. If you are a child of God, you live forever. If you are a child of God, He is your Father, your protector, your everything. Amen. You have forgotten who you are. You're a child of God. When you forget God's promises, Satan will pour fear upon you like never before. You know what happens? You know how you can tell fear? You know what causes fear? Uncertainty. Uncertainty causes fear. When you are uncertain of what tomorrow holds, when you are uncertain of how this is going to end, you fear. And like I said, fear turns into anxious. Anxious turns into stress. You turn into a miserable wreck. You end up on antidepressant pills. You can't sleep. You can't eat. You can't live. Jesus said, I am life. When you forget His promises, you lose peace. You notice right there what He says? When you're in a storm, when all everything around you is in chaos, what did Jesus do? What's the word He used? Peace! Peace! Because it's chaos and it's crazy and who can give you peace? Jesus. What did the disciples say? They were in awe. They looked right there and it says in verse 41, and they feared exceedingly and said one to another, what manner of man is this? I'll tell you who it is. It's your Lord and Savior. It is your Father. It is the sacrifice that died for you. Quit living in fear. Quit living in doubt. Quit living in I don't know. Trust Him. Believe in Him. The doctor says, we need to see you again. Oh no! The lawyer says, it ain't looking good. Oh no! The bank says, you can't make this payment. Oh no! What am I going to do? You trust Him. That's what you do. You put all your faith and your trust in Him. Have you ever seen somebody that walks around without a care in the world? Amy tells me all the time, she says, don't you ever care? Yeah, I do. Well, then why aren't you all upset? Well, if I can do something, I do. But if I can't, I'm trusting God to go fix it. And that's all you can do. My aunt told me I was about 20 years old. And I was just so mad at the situation one day. 
And it done got to where it was driving her crazy. <laughs> and she looked at me and she says, Jonathan, she said, can you fix this problem? I said, no ma'am. She said, then quit worrying about it. If you can do something about it, do it. If you can't, forget about it. Quit worrying about it. She said, for one, I'm tired of hearing about it. <laughs> she said, but number two, if you can't fix it, there ain't no need to worry about it. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you can do something about it, do it. If you can't, you trust Him that He's going to fix it for you. And you pray and you speak to Him and you have a relationship with Him and you have the faith that He can do it and will do it. But no matter what, you trust in the fact we win. Y'all, we were talking about it in Sunday school this morning and I'm closing. Every since God come to Abraham and he made a covenant with Abraham and said, I'm going to create a great nation through you, the children of Israel, the land of Israel, Israel, the people. Satan has done everything in his power to try to just stop it. He has tried to destroy it. Matter of fact, it says in Revelation chapter 12, we were reading it this morning, at how the woman travailed in pain. Throughout all of Israel's being a nation's history, Satan has done everything in his power to try to stop it. And then the nation uh, birthed a child, a man child. We all know him as Jesus. The Savior of the world. He died on the cross and won the war. Throughout all of history, though, even up to today, because Satan is mad at the land and the people of Israel, because the Savior of the world was birthed out of that nation. And if you look at the news today, the world hates Israel. Why? Because Satan is of the world. And the world hates Israel because Satan hates Israel. But has it stopped God's plan from Israel doing the things they were supposed to do? No. Has it stopped Israel from becoming a nation again in May 1948? No. Just like God's plan. Will it stop God's plan from the Messiah coming back? No. Satan is trying everything in his power to stop God's plan for your life. And if Satan does, it's because you let him. You let him. God has a plan for your life. God is the Lord and Savior of your life. Let Him. Get your peace back for 2019. Jesus came. The birth of um, in Luke chapter 2, what we read first, was the announcement of the angels to the shepherds. A man that will bring peace has been birthed. You want your peace back? You want 2019 to be peace? You better put your faith and your trust and remember what Jesus has done. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Nobody looking around for me. This morning, maybe you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Maybe you have never had a relationship with Jesus Christ. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. You say, well, what must I do, John? How do I get saved? First, you must recognize Jesus is the Son of God. Number two, you must realize you are a sinner. And that Jesus will wash away your sins. But you have to believe that with all your heart. There's nothing you can do. Nothing whatsoever you can do. To earn that salvation, it is a gift from God. <coughs> this morning, I want you to pray a prayer with me. If you truly want Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life, if you truly want a relationship with Jesus, you pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, I realize I am a sinner. Lord, I believe you sent your Son to die on the cross for me. And Lord, I'm asking you today to forgive me of my sins, to come into my heart and save my soul. Now, nobody looking around, if you prayed that prayer this morning, would you lift your hand? Anybody in here? Amen. 
Maybe you're sitting here and you say, Jonathan, I haven't had peace in a long time. I haven't had the freedom and the assurance of a good day in so long, I can't even remember. Don't live in fear no more. Don't live stressed anymore. Don't live depressed anymore.